Sue, I've been obsessed, I think like you, most of my life with consciousness, life after death, are there souls, uh, extrasensory perception. But I have never taken seriously so-called near-death experiences. You even put them this so-called in there. You're dismissing them from the outset. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm telling you honestly, because as a trained in neuroscience, a scientist, I, I think there's just an easy biological explanation for them uh, that they're kind of peripheral anyway. But I'm, I get a lot of criticism from people who say that I am ignoring, a, including one of my children, <laughs> who say that I'm ignoring a, a major area of, of information and facts about the world. Uh, but I've avoided it. And, uh, you know, uh, have I made a mistake? Is it, is it really some facts that we should consider in addressing this question? Yes. I mean, I don't want to go over the top, but I do think near-death experiences are really interesting and will tell us something helpful about consciousness. Um, they are, they can be profound, life-changing experiences. People are really changed by them. They have this common pattern all over the world and throughout what history we have. Um, what's going on and what does it tell us? Now, the sad thing in, and this really drives me up the wall, <clears throat> in fact, it drove me out of parapsychology out of studying near-death experiences because I got so sick of it, the starting point for the media is always on this side are it's all heaven and it proves life after death and the souls and the people who believe this are nice, spiritual, kind, compassionate people. And on the other side is Sue Blackmore and the enemy and the devil and all the bad people who say it's just a hallucination and it's just firing in the brain and, and, and it's not real. So they attribute realness and niceness to this and not realness and horribleness to this. Right. Well, the truth, as far as I'm concerned, is here is a really interesting transformative experience. I would even say in some cases a mystical or spiritual experience, which uh, reduces people's fear of death, which changes how they feel about the world. Um, and yet I don't think it provides any evidence at all for life after death. So let's take it seriously as one of the strange experiences that the human mind is capable of and see whether that can mm -hmm. help us okay. understand understand consciousness forget those black and white car caricatures it's so hard people keep people lapse to one side or the other the truth is i think much much more interesting okay but but the the issue it becomes then more of a of a psychological transformation uh, somebody could undergo uh, um, you know, an automobile accident where they got hurt and then it made them a different person or they could have some trauma in their life. And so it's a, it, it's a, it's a change of character, but it doesn't speak about the fundamental ontology of consciousness, what it really is. Well, it's not going to solve the hard problem. It's not going to take the problem away. But let's just look at some of the things we know about near-death experiences. Okay. All around the world and, and in different historical periods, people report a very similar thing. They report, as they uh, come close to death, and actually they don't need to be close to death, they could just be very scared, or they might be, as I was in the experience that led me into this in the first place, I was just sitting around with friends, I was ever so tired, I'd smoked a bit of cannabis, I was interested in paranormal things, and I had this extraordinary outpouring of this sequence of experiences. It was only decades later that all the research on near-death experiences came about and I discovered that I'd had all of these things. So typically you have a dark tunnel moving through a dark tunnel towards mm -hmm. a bright light mm -hmm. and out of the body experience in which you seem to be looking at the world from a position outside your body and maybe even watching things happening to the body. Going into the light or another world where there seem to be other beings, other creatures and so on and so on. Um, extraordinary emotions which they're more mundane, are, are kind of, it's all very nice, but at their more interesting, I think, are acceptance. This is how it is. This mm -hmm. is how it should be. Mm -hmm. All my life has been the most terrible struggle against everything, but this is fine. Everything, all shall be well and all shall be well, that sort of feeling. Um, and then if it carries on, um, a decision to return and the feeling of, do I go back or do I go on into the mm -hmm. bliss? Mm -hmm. So those, so, those are cut, cuts across different cultures? Absolutely. Now, Another interesting fact about this is tunnels, lights and so on are cross-cultural, but the details of what people see are absolutely well, dependent the, on their the religion. spiritual being at the end, that's got to exactly. be culturally so the, Exactly. So the Christians are going to see St. 
Peter at the <laughs> pearly gates right. and that the Hindus are going to have a book and the name is not in it, they got the name wrong and they're right. sent back or, right. you know, all of that is culturally dependent. But the basic unfolding yeah. thing isn't. So here is something to tell us about a brain that is for some reason in trouble that you get this sequence of unfolding experiences. Now, isn't that interesting? And it's certainly interesting. Now, to my mind, the most interesting ones are not the just the out-of-the-body experience, which is so easy to interpret in terms of something has left the body. Now, we now know the physiology. We know where they're produced okay. in the temporoparietal junction. We can induce them. You know, that's, that's solved the mystery of how they come about. And I can see why people jump to the conclusion that their soul has left their body. But being a bit more insightful about it, then what's going on? There seems to be a breakdown of this dualism. In the more profound near-death experiences, what happens is not, oh, I've gone to heaven stuff. You get beyond that to into this state of, of equanimity and acceptance in which I am no longer a little isolated self, but are now in, in, in interpenetration, dependency, interdependency, oneness, just is how it is, as in a classical mystical experience. And what I think is happening in these deeper near-death experiences is that that delusion of I'm a separate self having a stream of experiences is being is being worn away because the brain can no longer construct that that oh. illusion that I'm self. It's no longer constructing the hard problem and the, the difficulties of dualism and becomes and, at one. And therefore you think it is in a sense... Uh Closer to truth? Closer to truth. I do think it's closer when, to truth. When you have a near-death experience, it's because you're eliminating the artificial things that the yeah. brain does. Yeah, the things that get in the way of seeing clearly. So that, that's an interesting approach. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a neuroscientific approach. It, uh, it obviously doesn't confirm an afterlife or a soul oh, or no. anything like that. I don't think there's any evidence whatsoever How about that it the does. claim of many in, in uh, near-death experiences that they come back with information they didn't know or... Show me. Or, uh, you know... Show or, me. I mean, you, you've heard the stories more than I, I'm sure. Of course. Well, sorry, you may have heard them, but yes, <laughs> no. I, I did spend a, a long time, right. a long time ago right. investigating these. I mean, there was a very famous one a long time ago um, uh, of a, a hospital in Seattle where this woman called Maria was brought in in the ambulance. She couldn't possibly have been able to see the rest of the building. She was unconscious and she reported floating above her body and she saw a tennis shoe and the lace was just under uh -huh. the heel in a certain way and uh -huh. it was up on this ledge and her social worker... Um, Kimberly Clark went looking for this shoe and she knocked on lots of doors and eventually she found the office of the secretary or whatever and they looked out the window and there was the, the shoe and it had exactly the lace in exactly the same way um, and she couldn't possibly have known and this proves, you know, Okay, so I try to investigate it. We're going back more than 20 years now because I gave up this research a while ago but this is a typical the thing that happened to me again and again. So I try and investigate and I write letters and I phone and so on and so on. And the end of these investigations is the only story we have is from the social worker herself. There is no corroboration from anywhere else. There's no record of Maria having told anybody about it independently. She was a, mi a migrant um, fruit picker who disappeared and couldn't be found again. There's no record of which room it was. There's no picture of the shoe. There's no uh, record of, of the secretary who supposedly said it was there. There's nothing. But one, that one person's story is not sufficient to overthrow all of science. Yeah. And, 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 and then you go to the next level that says, if in some cases there is a correlation that gets reported and everybody is mystified by it, how about all the infinite number of things that are not reported because yeah. they didn't happen? And that's a, that's a constant problem in, in parapsychology. But I think it's very special here with near-death experiences. It's another reason why I think I want to persuade you to take, you know, take them seriously because they're very interesting, is how much people want it to be true. Yeah, sure. Because this delusion we have of the self inside, we cling like anything. And you could say it's the heart of our problems. Dan Dennett calls it a benign user illusion. I call it a malign user illusion. It's the cause of our a lot of our greed, uh, suffering, uh, uh, disappointment, uh, uh, hatred, uh, 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 self-protection, all of uh, that stuff. So more, more of us should have a near-death experience. <laughs> you, you could <laughs> say that. You, you, you could say that. But, but part of this belief in this inner self is um, that near-death experiences have to be true. Um, 
and what they seem to be, something going to heaven. And so people cling on to it. So the slightest little hint of somebody saw something in a drawer, they actually saw the instruments, is taken, you know, just so, so seriously. Now, what we need and what we have going on at the moment are properly controlled experiments in uh, resuscitation places or, or a cardiac um, wards or wherever it's appropriate, where you've got some kind of target which somebody if they were really right, floating right. out of their right, body, right. would be able to see, and which is really difficult for anybody to climb up there and have a look and cheat and all of that. <laughs> and there are experiments going on. It's called the AWARE Project. Um, Peter Fenix, Sampania and others are working on this um, and have been for a long time. If the conditions were good, I was satisfied with the, um, the, the experimental Sorry, controls, mm -hmm. and they really did report that. I'm wrong. It hasn't happened yet, and I don't think it will. But it's possible, and then that would change everything. But for the moment, I don't think there's any good evidence at all for all the stories that there are. And hey, it's much more interesting to think of near-death experiences as actually illuminating self and other as a way to non-duality than to see it as just another kind of oh, heaven uh, wishful thinking, don't you think? Have I persuaded you that maybe they I, are interesting? I'd like interesting? to study it, but I come out where you come out. I just eliminated all everything in between. Fair enough. <laughs>